Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. It's always a pleasure to come back to London. I, I lived here for three years where I, I got my uh, PhD 40 years ago uh, in London. Um, <coughs> so, uh, preventing aggression and violence through intergenerational intervention. And I've subtitled this, When Should Hercules Fight Hydra? So you'll see more about Hydra a little bit uh, later. Uh, but uh, as you know, if you want to fight Hydra, it's not sufficient to chop one head. <coughs> um, <coughs> I started my career working with uh, mentally ill offenders, work my way backwards to juvenile delinquents, to aggressive kindergarten children, and I'm working with uh, pregnant women. And I'm going to tell you why I'm now uh, working with pregnant women. The main research questions that I've addressed over the years was, are when do humans start to use physical aggression? What are the different developmental trajectories? What are the causes of these different developmental trajectories? And how can we prevent chronic physical aggression? Um, <clears throat> you all know this age crime curve where it peaks in late adolescence, early adulthood, and decreases over time. Um, that curve, uh, for those who need to be remembered, uh, has been, was drawn first by Adolf Kettle, a Belgian astronomer, mathematician, who was interested in um, moral development, physical development, and cognitive development. The panel on understanding and control of violent behavior um, that published its report in 1993 uh, in the US wrote, modern psychological perspective emphasized that aggressive and violent behaviors are learned responses to frustration, that they can also be learned as instruments for achieving goals and that the learning occurs by observing models of such behavior. Such models may be observed in the family, among peers, elsewhere in the neighborhood, through the mass media. This idea of social learning was uh, the reason why <clears throat> in 1984, uh, I started this longitudinal study with a group uh, of colleagues in Montreal. We focused on a thousand boys from low socioeconomic areas in Montreal. Why boys low socioeconomic? We all know that they're the most at risk in the long run. Uh, but our aim was to try to understand <coughs> how they were learning to aggress and um, we had this idea that if we start in kindergarten, we'll understand much better this development. And we've been following them over the years. Uh, this slide is uh, now 10 years old because uh, they're now turning, they're at the end of their 30s, and we are now following them and their children. What we observed uh, from that study, uh, the most striking uh, um, observation that we did not expect was <laughs> this result uh, with uh, th the help of Daniel Nagan in analyzing developmental trajectories. We observed that over time from kindergarten to the mid middle adolescence, 
the frequency of physical aggression was decreasing for almost all of, of the boys except for 4%, the top yellow line, 4% of the boys were maintaining a high level of physical aggression. All the others were decreasing the frequency of their physical aggression over time. From that study, we <coughs> observed that those who were on the high trajectory, the 4%, uh, in terms of outcome, not surprisingly, they had all the problems you can imagine. School failure, tobacco use and abuse, alcohol use and abuse, drugs, early sex violence, <coughs> depression, unemployment, poverty. We also followed in another, another sample, um, a random sample of the kindergarten children in the province of Quebec in, in Canada. We also observe a similar pattern for girls. Girls use aggression less frequently than boys from early on, uh, <coughs> but those who use physical aggression the most fr in, um, from kindergarten onwards, although the frequency is decreasing, they, their trajectory leads them also to tobacco use and abuse, school failure, early sex, partner aggression, depression, teenage pregnancy, and welfare. The conclusions from that study was that physical aggression does not start during adolescence. Frequency of physical aggression does not increase after school entry. Children use physical aggression most often in kindergarten, and the most physically aggressive during adolescence were the most aggressive in kindergarten. Within that study, we did a randomized control trial. So we randomly allocated part of the most aggressive hyperactive in kindergarten to an intervention group and a control group. So I'll be giving you now some results, long-term results from that randomized control trial. And we are comparing the kindergarten boys who did not have behavior problems, hyperactivity, aggression in kindergarten at 70% of these boys, to the 30% who were the most aggressive and hyperactive in kindergarten. The intervention was an intensive preventive intervention. We had psychologists and social workers that were visiting the families at home every second week over a two-year period from the first year of elementary school to uh, the end of the second year of elementary school. At the same, same time, we were at school do doing social skills training, and the social skills training was not putting the aggressives together to try to help them learn not to aggress, but rather putting one or two aggressive within a group of highly pro-social peers so that they could learn from their peers. And at the same time, um, so this part, the social skills training was over a two-year period, and we were giving support to the teachers in the same way that we were supporting the parents. The impact during adolescence was <coughs> less alcohol, less alcohol use over time for the intervention group and less 
num less drugs uh, used during adolescence and in early adulthood we observe um, if you start by the left of the slide the control group um, are the aggressives who did not get the intervention so only 32 percent of them finish high school those the aggressives that got the intervention 46 percent of them uh, finished high school and the non-aggressive in kindergarten 53 percent finished high school this is low but remember we're talking about boys from low socioeconomic environments when we looked at criminal behavior by age 24 we saw that the aggressives in kindergarten that didn't get the intervention 33 percent of them had a criminal record those who got the aggressives that got the intervention only 22 percent had the criminal record and those who were not aggressive but from low socioeconomic areas 16 percent had a criminal record We also analyzed the data from that 1,000 boys from low socioeconomic sample to see to what extent interventions, the, the normal uh, court interventions during adolescence had an impact on um, <coughs> criminal condemnations between 18 and 24 years of age. Uh, this is uh, for those who uh, are interested in the statistics of it. This is a propensi propensity score matching where we are matching boys on their characteristic during elementary school and looking at the impact of court interventions. And um, sadly, what we observe is that those who were sent to court and receive the services to help them during adolescence the increase the probability was that they were 40 percent most more likely to have a criminal record than those with a similar background that did not go to court um, <coughs> So the conclusions from, for that intervention, for, for these two types of intervention, early from seven to nine, decreases the likelihood of drug abuse, school dropout, juvenile delinquency, and adult criminality, while as the juvenile court intervention increased the likelihood of adult criminality. Now the following question was when does physical aggression start if they are at their peak in kindergarten we create an, created another longitudinal study a random sample of the population of births in the province of Quebec um, so we're talking about 2,000 a little bit more than 2,000 children that we have been uh, following they, they're now in their early uh, late uh, adolescence <coughs> and we have observation from many different uh, environments in which they live uh, so what do we observe in terms of aggression if we start at birth well um, these are six month old children uh, the boy on the right um, is the grandson of one of my good friends and um, he, the, my, the, the grandfather sent me the photograph saying look uh, what um, my grandson is doing <laughs> he appears to be doing what you're interested in so I, I asked the uh, 
I asked the mother, uh, can I use that photograph that it's a photograph that she had taken and she said yes at one condition. When you show this photograph, you have to say he was only defending himself. <laughs> um, so when we aggress, uh, we are, mother says, we are defending ourselves. Now I'm going to show you um, a video of aggression in early childhood to give you a taste of what we observe. Ah, Maxime ne veut pas partager ses jouets. Aujourd'hui, à Dr. Nadia, psychologue à l'Unicé. Ça se résume souvent par une claque. Il est assis sur quelque chose, il pousse, il jette à terre. Euh, C'est assez violent comme, euh, comme conflit quand ça éclate. Okay, so you don't have to understand French to understand what is going on here. Um, <coughs> the older one is three and a half, uh, the younger one is uh, almost two. And you see that um, fighting for toys is not because of the lack of toys. Um, <coughs> children start very early uh, to physically aggress each other. And, and so this, these are the developmental trajectories that we observe from 17 months of age to 60 months of age, uh, physical aggression increases for everybody um, as your motor development uh, 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 gets better. And um, the peak is between uh, around 42, uh, 42 months of age. This has been replicated in a number of studies in uh, other European countries uh, and in uh, the United States and in Australia. And, and so the peak is, in, is around 42 months of age and then the frequency of physical aggression decreases. Um, if we put together all the data we have from one point one and a half years of age and 21 years of age, um, these are the developmental traje trajectories. There is a chronic group, individuals that use physical aggression much more in um, early childhood and maintain that high level of aggression. Um, but everybody has done it and most of us learn uh, to control that type of behavior. Uh, so the conclusions for these, from these longitudinal studies is that humans do not learn to physically aggress. They learn not to physically aggress. Chronic physical aggression is very rarely late onset. From the available evidence, this may be true for other behaviors such as stealing and destruction of, prop of property. When you look at these behavior, in early childhood, it's, uh, it happens many times in a day, uh, not uh, once uh, in a while. <coughs> so over the last few years, we've been interested in the uh, causal mechanisms uh, in terms of aggression. What causes chronic physical aggression is it the environment? Is it genes? Is it genes that moderate the environment? Is it the environment that impacts genes? So I'm going to show you um, some of these results. 
from an environmental perspective, um, the best predictors of chronic physical aggression from early childhood onwards are the following if we start at the bottom. Um, and here we're, we, we're comparing data that we have from both parents um, in the families. We have teenage pregnancy, poor marital relationships, maternal low education, poverty, maternal anger, maternal depression, maternal stress, maternal malnutrition during pregnancy, and maternal smoking during pregnancy. Uh, so this is my Hydra, and as you can see, uh, the Hydra has um, a lot of maternal characteristics that are standing out, and I think this is extremely important if we want to think about prevention, early prevention, and especially intergenerational early prevention, and that's what I will show you um, for the rest of this talk. We also created a longitudinal study from birth with twins, monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins. As you know, monozygotic twins have the same genes. Dizygotic twins are like brothers or sisters, they share half their genes. So twins are very useful to understand if something is genetic or environmental. And so when we look at the development of physical aggression early on in early childhood, here we're talking about uh, 20 months, 32 months, and 50 months, and we look at to what extent <coughs> the pair of twins are very similar in terms of aggression or, or different. What we observe is that they are much more similar among monozygotic twins and among dizygotic <laughs> twins, and this is an indicator that we have a genetic effects because both sets of twins, the monozygotic and the dizygotic, share the same environment uh, so if it was an environmental effect, both monozygotic and dizygotic would be similar. Uh, but if it's a genetic effect, then you see more differences among the dizygotic than among uh, the monozygotic. So over um, when we look at genetic effects at age 20 months, 32 months, and 50 months, we see that um, genetic effects are between 50% and 63%. So it's not all genetics, but it's at least half genetic. Another, the other half is possibly environmental. And uh, we also see that the effects of genetic factors uh, at 20 months are substantially decreased over time while new genetic effects appear at 32 and 50 months. So when we say it's genetic, it's not some genes over the life course, it's many genes. And over the life course, these genes, the genes that control uh, or lack of control of aggression um, <coughs> may change. But when we look at twin studies, uh, the, the traditional genetic studies with twins that we did here, we do not control for something that's recent in terms of knowledge concerning genetics it's epigenetic effects. And I'm going to, you've probably heard of epigenetic effects uh, before. It, we started hearing about this 
10 years ago. And um, the people who sort of showed that it ma epigenetic mattered not only for cancer, but uh, for behavior and, and for parenting um, are two colleagues at the University of McGill, Moishe Schiff and Michael Meany. And they showed with um, mice that maternal licking at birth has an epigenetic effect in the sense that the more the, the pups are licked by the mother, the better the brain develops to control behavior over time. And the more they are licked, the longer they live because the less, the better they can control stress. That was known for uh, quite a number of years, but the mechanism was not known. And by analyzing the impact on genes, and that's the epigenetic story, um, they showed that the licking sent a chemical signal to activate genes, and <coughs> if you don't get licked enough, that chemical signal is too weak, and important genes in the brain are not activated. Um, <coughs> I was then involved in a study with uh, Moishe Schiff and Steve Sumi, um, where we looked at um, a similar model, but with monkeys. Um, these are monkeys that um, the experiment started in the 1950s to study attachment. So monkeys at birth, are some are separated from their mothers and brought up uh, with other young monkeys, but without the care of the mother. And others are brought up by their mothers. And um, we, we, have, we had access to the brains of uh, these individuals uh, after their death. And we looked at the DNA methylation um, of genes in, in their brains. And we showed that there were important differences in the brain, um, in the DNA methylation in the brain of the monkeys uh, when we're comparing those who were um, brought up by their mothers and those who were not brought up. And uh, the reason we chose the monkeys is that we knew that the monkeys who are separated for, from their mothers at birth, um, they are extremely aggressive throughout their life. Um, so we've tried to apply this approach with humans. And so um, I'll explain the hypothesis that we have. Uh, remember the slide? The girls who have problems with aggression over time um, have many problems. and. They also tend to become pregnant earlier on in life. So if we put that finding in a developmental, intergenerational developmental perspective, we have girls with behavior problem who mate with males that have similar problems. It's very rare that these girls will mate with boys without problem. And when these girls become pregnant, what does the obstetrician and the neonatologist see? He sees a young pregnant woman who failed in school, smokes during pregnancy, is depressed, is angry, is stressed, malnourished, is on welfare, uh, and has poor marital relationships. 
we made the hypothesis that this has an impact on the fetus, on the development of the brain starting prenatally and that it impacts the behavior. We also very well know that the environment in which these uh, children are born, they, they're, the mother and the father have always had problems controlling themselves, uh, so you can imagine the quality of the environment after birth. Uh, <coughs> so the hypothesis is that the environment, both prenatally and postnatally, affects gene expression, and the, the, the gene expression that control the brain and the brain that controls behavior. So we tested that hypothesis using the boys and the girls by, that we had been following over the years, comparing the chronic cases with those who had normal development. And uh, this is the type of results, the, the simple way to present the results, um, where uh, you have the chronic group on the left side and the normal group, and each dot is a gene, and the genes you can measure to what extent they are turned on or turned off. So those, are, those in black are turned off, those in white are turned on. And so you can visually, you can see the difference in terms of gene expression uh, for those who were chronic versus those who were not chronic, um, there are clearly important differences in gene expression between uh, these two groups. Um, and so when um, we, gene, if a gene that is methylated is not, cannot express itself. Uh, so we're comparing DNA methylation in T cells. And in males, we saw that there were 448 distinct gene promoters that were differently methylated, and that these genes, many of these genes, were previously shown to play a role in aggression. Uh, for the girls, similar results we observed that 430 uh, <laughs> gene promoters um, were differently methylated, comparing the aggressive uh, girls and the non-aggressive. A significant proportion of these associations were similar to those observed with uh, chronically aggressive males. So there are similar effects on males and females in terms of the the genes that are uh, methylated. Um, <clears throat> so the epigenetic uh, signature of childhood chronic physical aggression in females appears to have a component that is similar to males and another component that is different. <coughs> um, so the conclusions, when we think of conclusions for early prevention, Epigenetic analyses have started to identify the mechanisms by which the environment substantially impacts on human development. Environments, mothers, fathers, nutrition, stress, can probably modify genetic programming <coughs> better than attempts to directly manipulate genes. By enriching the environment at the appropriate time and intensity, we should have system-wide impacts on gene expression and thus on brain development and on behavior. Environmental effects on human development, like genetic effects, appear strongly intergenerational and highly linked to maternal development. If this is true, 
prevention of chronic physical aggression and other developmental problems needs to take an intergenerational perspective and start in early pregnancy at the latest. When I, I say aggression problems and other developmental problems, these ideas are present in the medical field for most of the chronic illnesses that we have. It's becoming clearer and clearer that the problems that we get in terms of cancer, in terms of heart disease, started early in utero from in utero environmental <coughs> effects. So it's not surprising that we would find that also for a behavior. And these ideas are, it's called the Barker hypothesis, and it started here in London uh, by uh, Barker, who uh, followed, um, measured the um, heart rate problems in a large sample of minors. I think it was in, in Wales that they have good, they had good data on uh, birth weight and uh, death of, of minors. And this led to this whole uh, idea of developmental origins of health. Um, and there is also developmental origins of uh, criminal behavior. So this means that although chronic behavior problems are largely a male problem, its early prevention requires giving the best services to pregnant women and families of newborn, because this targets the natural intergenerational biopsychosocial systems. This conclusion is also probably true for numerous other physical problems like obesity, cardiovascular disease, psychological problems like depression, substance abuse, sexual abuse, and socioeconomic problems like <laughs> school performance and employment. Someone said it much more simply, the chief of the Soli people in Zambia, when you educate a man, an individual is educated. When you educate a woman, you educate her children and thus the nation. Thank you.